that uh, we changed everything from the mission on down. And our work today is much more about engagement, uh, that the key to community and the key to community philanthropy is engaging people uh, in their community. Uh, there are many different kinds of community and many different kinds of engagement. And one of the ways that we're trying uh, to do that is at the neighborhood level. And this, again, is one of the ways in which our work has changed in the last five years. Um, and uh, we have, in particular, over the last year or two, been focused on specific neighborhood doing place-based philanthropy. And in this neighborhood, the Hill neighborhood, uh, is one of them. the foundation's been active in the Hill for many, many years. So we're building on a long track record here. Uh, we uh, have involved neighborhood residents, and Barbara Jennings is going to speak on behalf of our Hill advisory group in a moment. Uh, but we've involved neighborhood residents uh, in our process here in the Hill uh, since 2005. We reached out not just to the activists, we've got nothing against activists, we love activists, but uh, we reached out beyond the activists in 2005 to, uh, to uh, neighborhood residents, actually randomly selected neighborhood residents, who we went door to door with people who were planning process. Um, and the planning process led to the neighborhood advisory group, but also led to the definition of some priorities, uh, focus priorities for programs that focus on youth and youth employment, uh, and activities that would strengthen the sense, neighborhood sense of community, um, including possibly a community center. So a lot's been going on over the last year as an outgrowth of that. We've mapped the project this summer in storytelling. Some of that is talked about in our annual report, which many of you have seen in the looking at. Uh, just a few minutes ago. Another thing I think that's, that I learned, uh, as I said, I was brand new at the foundation the last time Bill was here in the May, but one of the things I learned is that, that philanthropy is fundamentally about inspiration. Uh, it's inspiring people to engage, inspiring people to engage and to get involved and contribute in whatever way they can. Um, and one thing that hasn't changed since 2001 is that Bill Sturman uh, continues to be a unique inspiration for neighborhood development, for youth development, for community development. The work that he's done in, in Pittsburgh has really inspired uh, people all over the country and indeed has inspired, um, now is inspiring uh, uh, reputation of all over the country as well. That was a gleam in your eye when you were together in 2000, 2001. Now it's much more than So I'm going to ask Bill in a moment to present. First, I'd like to call in Barbara Jennings, who's the chairman of our. Of our uh, advisory group to say a few words on behalf of the community and then we'll turn this uh, to the bill. the call to get to meet some of the other folks from the community foundation and to hear This was a very unique opportunity. The community foundation, I'm from the Haven, uh, I guess a very good part of my life in the Hill since the early 60s, almost in the same house. But this was the first time that a project or an inspiration came where the sponsors wanted the community's opinion. They didn't come and say, okay, we've got a couple of dollars, blah, 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 blah. They wanted us to say what we wanted, and it's really that's what piqued my interest, and it's really, even to my own amazement, moved very quickly. Some people don't think so, but it takes a lot to get started. We didn't have a place, we had to find a site. Then um, we needed to hire a network manager, and that took a little time, but we have one in Candy, who does a great job, she's a great people person. And then we had to have a car group, and somehow, I don't know how we said Cheryl, Leader, I won't find your name. So great and lovely. <laughs> but we had a small car group, and then others that join us when they can from time to time because they are the lucky to run retired. So I have a lot more time than some of our working people. So this is a great opportunity for us to hear your presentation, hopefully, to give us some ideas. And we've accomplished this week, we're working with uh, Bridget Carswell. And we now have a vision statement, which would be my big thing and Anna's good thing. So now we're going to have a good idea where we're going. And we're just going to keep on going. So, thank you. Thank you. Corporation. And it's a subsidiary, it's Manchester Craftsman Field and Global Training Center, which I won't describe. You're about to see a presentation on it, and I know that I wouldn't do it justice by description in any event. Suffice to say, it is truly one of the most unique and inspiring and copied uh, community development. Uh, projects in the country. 
Um, Bill is a Pittsburgher by birth, by education, um, and uh, to this day, which as someone who's worked a little bit in Pittsburgh and been to Pittsburgh, and when the first time I was over there, remarked how much he reminded me of Avon because of this incredibly strong neighborhood fabric um, and the industrial history. Uh, so he is uh, clearly someone who understands these kinds of neighborhoods and what community like this uh, is made out of. Just to give you a sense of the uh, uh, of the kind of recognition that Bill has had and his work has had. Um, he has uh, received the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Arts and Leadership Services, uh, receiving the so called Genius Awards. That's not a great way to get certified <laughs> Genius Awards. Um, and uh, I was actually on the way over here when I was talking. I was very pleased uh, to hear that he is being honored this year uh, with the Ron Brown Award, named after my late uh, mother in law's congressman. Uh, he's a, uh, he served a six-year presidential appointment at the National Endowment for the Arts and is a member of the President's Committee of Arts and Humanities now. So Bill, it's an honor and a privilege to see you having the day when you're here as our guest. I'm not officially here because I'm doing something called tea, and the reason I'm doing that is uh, one of our interns is now an undergraduate at Yale. I guess she's doing pretty good. And she said, we have these teas and we'd like you to come up that tea. <laughs> so that's why I'm here officially. <laughs> Apparently, these teas are a pretty good deal. I've, I've since learned that you know, I'm just walking off the street with you on these things. So, um, so, anyway, it Will's correct. We met uh, half a dozen years ago, I guess, and um, I'm still doing the same thing. Uh, so, what I'm actually going to do is show you pictures of my set because I don't, I don't have any speech. These are just pictures of what I do, but you'll see from the pictures kind of what I believe in and kind of where I'm coming from. I work in a very poor neighborhood, a black neighborhood in Pittsburgh. It's the same neighborhood where I was born. Uh, so my whole life story is six blocks. I've never actually left the neighborhood, never will. Uh, the idea is to get the world to come there rather than me go someplace else. Uh, I went to local high school in the University of Pittsburgh. And my life was actually changed by a public school teacher who got me excited about ceramics when I was a high school kid. And I was a typical inner city black kid, not paying any attention to the school system, flunking out. And this art teacher, an Italian guy named Frank Ross, uh, got me excited about ceramics. I got pretty good at it. And he said, I'm leaving this school, you're going to college, man. So he helped me fill out a college application for pay where I'm now a trustee. And so I actually sent a board to let him a years ago. And while I was at Pitt, I found that Manchester Craftsman's Guild was working with poor kids in the streets doing the rides. And when I, in an old row house, wasn't in the building, I'm sure, it was an old funky row house. Mm -hmm. We built a kiln out back, and wheels in the basement, and I literally started dragging kids in off the streets to save their soul from play. And I'm still doing it, just on a much bigger scale. But I heard back from people from the school system that whatever I was doing with these kids, they were starting to show up at school more regularly. And after a couple of years of doing that, I figured out there wasn't anything wrong with the kids. The school system was screwed up. The kids were fine. They just needed clay and enthusiasm. You know, somebody believed in them. So with that insight, I found that Manchester Crafts was built in 1968, before half of you probably were even born. Uh, and I did this thing uh, in a row house when I was growing up. And then what was a vocational school, I took it over in 1972. It was in an old warehouse with holes in the floor and holes in the roof. No windows in the building. And uh, I took it over because I didn't know it then. And I said, God, can I save everybody and all that? So I took over Bidwell at the end of the rides. My first official act with Bidwell was to the building. About fear and about pain. <laughs> <laughs> like I got show up and paint this building as fire. The one guy didn't show up that fire. I said, the point of the story is we're not going to live like this. We're going to take control of our situation. We're going to paint this building. We're going to work our way out from that. You know, one step at a time. So, what you're going to see is what I did with this whole thing. 20 some years ago, I hired a student, a Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect. So, I built a Frank Lloyd Wright building in my neighborhood. And We'll get you guys to come visit. Uh, if you fly, you'll fly to Greater Pittsburgh International Airport. My building was the scale model for the Pittsburgh Airport. So it's kind of famous in that regard. And let's see here. And that place in that building where there's something. 
you and not looking back at you. That's very good. Uh, she wants me to move. Uh, maybe you guys can do that. You can't see through me, obviously. So. Okay, so maybe I'm, I'll move over this. We'll move over this way. That's the entrance to the world. We have the Amish quilts and everything throughout the building. And we've discovered that environment determines behavior. You go nurturing environment, people have a tendency to do like the environment. You go to prison, they have that thing. Now, that's Jimmy James C. Spot Run stuff, but the PhD runs schools and stuff, figured it out. So I figured it out. And I have a bachelor's degree in history. Lucky to have that the way I did. <laughs> now that's our boardroom. I commissioned Japanese cabinet and they could do 60 pieces of furniture for a school. That's all furniture that was actually cut from Pennsylvania lumber. And it was a Japanese guy who built this stuff. He came from Kyoto, Japan. I heard it. So he could teach furniture. I found out this guy was a very important woodworker. So I commissioned him to do 60 pieces of furniture for the school. And uh, he's now in his own business, making a fortune. He's got a waiting list now, one year long, for a high net worth people buying his furniture. But we got it for our school, the level of welfare loans, the average kids see that much. Okay, it's good. We even have fresh flowers in the building every day. Not plastic. I have never figured out that plastic flowers are going to do improve the world. Uh, and the idea is that uh, these little details that you don't think amount to very much, they amount to very much. People really are a function of the environment. And these kids are uh, for they know what it's like. And the fact that we've got fresh flowers in this bright, lit, gorgeous building really has an effect on their behavior. 23 years of operation have never affected or drug or alcohol and stuff. Never had any theft, never had a police visit, never had a close to And the toughest neighborhood in Pittsburgh was the highest crime, which I think I made. My high school is four blocks away, it's still there. Steel doors, metal detectors, guards in the hallway, uh, and bars in the window. I'm four blocks away with a Franklin right building, it's all glass. I've never had a broken window. Uh, you can say I'm the luckiest guy on the planet for 23 years. Well, there's something about the way that we're treating these kids and the attitude that we bring is really determined their behavior. I think it's that. What neighborhood are you speaking of? Northside, North Manchester, uh, think downtown Pittsburgh. We're five minutes from downtown Pittsburgh. <laughs> My teacher went to Carnegie Tech. Uh, yes, he did. And he was killed, unfortunately, in a traffic accident about three years before I built the sack. So he never lived to see this building. But he lived long enough to see that I was going to be okay. And that's at Christmas time. And we built a million dollar kitchen with a the highest kitchen company, which happens to be a pistol. And the senator who was killed in the plane accident was John Hines, who was really a fabulous guy. He would have been president of the United States. But we were good buddies, and he gave me a million bucks, and we hired the head of culinary for the highest County. And we created a curriculum for his welfare mothers, and we trained them to be gourmet cooks in this million dollar kitchen. And we get everybody in the industry a job those two things. And it's really much of a good thing. We built an amphitheater for the students. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, want, I didn't know you wanted the questions at the end. or. I, I wanted to ask you, why do you think it is that institutions or, or people that work in bureaucracies don't get your point? Because it's such a good one about space. Oh, okay. okay. I'll run through these because I can put them on top. Okay. Maybe it's coming just to show the pictures. <laughs> uh, we built an amphitheater for the students. We bring chefs from all over the world who do product presentations at our center. I don't train chefs, I train gourmet cooks. Ten months. Very focused, but they go to work in private clubs, country clubs, and institutions. No fast food is ever done in our center. We also serve the food that the students every day. Mm -hmm. So they eat a gourmet lunch for, for, uh, every day at the school. 
two bucks. And the whole idea is I wanted to change the perception about food. Food's for everybody on the planet, not just for you. Speaking of someone who had lunch there, it's memorable. <laughs> I had many vivid memories that day at lunch. That's our pastry department. One of our students. This is the dining room on an average day. And what we discovered is the black folks and white folks eat together voluntarily. But what we learned is that if you go to a beautiful facility, if you run that way, people get along. If you go to prison, you have that privilege. This is the work the students are doing after six months. Now these are all the people with no background in food. Okay? So they don't have any predisposition to do this when we recruit them. But in six months, I've got them doing that. We emphasize color and texture and presentation. That's all pastries. I've actually eaten six of them baskets. <laughs> That's our dining room. Looks like the average high school cafeteria in New Haven, right? Um, well, the idea is we wanted to create an environment that let the kids know that they are worth it. And we now do a lot of uh, uh, catered events at our school. The Engineer Society uses us, the Physician Society uses us, the Surgeons use us, and so forth. Great cross market. We also train pharmaceutical technicians for the medical industry. I got into this because people have heard about me training food people for the food industry. And the principle I want you to get in your head is if you do things right, the employers will show up. They'll call you, particularly if you're working with minorities in a successful way. We also train chemical technicians for the chemical industry. Bayer, Calvin, and Carbon, BASF, Fisher Scientific, Nova Chemicals. Now, black folks, welfare mothers, doing analytic chemistry for 10 months without a background in science, using uh, logarithmic calculators. Now, I'm telling you, Mr. Sure to understand it, man, because I see this every day. And what we've been able to figure out, the other thing wrong with poor people is they don't have the money, which happens to be a curable condition. It's all in the way that you treat people that Terms of the outcomes of their behavior. Now, I've got poor folks who don't know anything about science. I have 40 technicians working for Bayer right now because of my brother their research facility, basically. Bayer's the presence here. Bayer's North American Research Center really? versus five miles from here. That's very good. That's very good. We change the way that Bayer sees uh, the inner city. They, you know, everybody is very cynical originally. So you can't train a black people to be careful. At least try, you know, if I screw up, it's not, no, no, no harm done. Well, we got 40 technicians working for them right now. And once they saw that I actually could train technicians competently, black and white, we became their training program. And now they're talking to us about calling their objection over the technicians. Very exotic, complicated process of molding, like car bumpers and that kind of stuff. Mirrors there. It's an extruded process, and um, we could start training these technicians. They start at forty-five thousand dollars a year. So we got Bayer, Calvin Carbon, BASF, Nova, Hawk. When you get back to Pittsburgh, I'll show you a brand new lab that we dedicated to the man from Bayer who came to visit us twenty years ago, who was initially very skeptical. He not only became our biggest advocate, we went out and raised a pot of money and built the lab and named it after the guy. Now, that's not close to the circle. You tell me what it is. So it's worked out pretty good. Now, we also teach people how to read, how to computerized literacy center for the people in the program that have high school diplomas in the camera. Not one, I got locked. And there are kids right here in this town. Mm -hmm. uh, Walking around with diplomas at the bottom of the camera. So the moral of the story is we ain't gonna make it, guys. Uh, the dropout rate now for Hispanic and African American kids in America is 50%. One out of two in the whole country. There's no way any country can sustain that. 
So the idea that I decide I have evolved to the point where I want to go center, ever, yesterday, uh, including this time. So, that's our library. Uh, this is a kind of a technical resource of the homeless thing that we do at the school. This is Manchester Craftsman's Guild. Remember I'm the guy from 60 Megan Pottery? Well, this is what I created. The name is from my neighbor in Manchester. Craftsman's Guild was the concept. Mr. Ross used to bring these books on the English craft guilds. So I got into this whole thing of mentor and apprentice and all that. And I said, yeah, that's cool. So I named it Craftsman's Guild after that idea. And Manchester Craftsman's Guild literally had become a very big name. But I figured out looking out my door. 1968, so that was the science behind the name. But this turned out to be a big deal, as you'll see. So we work with 500 kids in the public schools, grades 8 through 12, clay, photography, digital engineering. I put 90% of those kids in college last year. I've averaged over 90% in 15 years, I don't teach the academics. What we teach is uh, motivation. What we discovered is as the kids get put in clay, their attendance in school goes up. As their attendance goes up, their grades go up. And I said, that's the answer, man. You have to build programs that motivate kids to want to learn. Hello? Um, eight of my faculty are former kids who went through the program, went to college, or back teaching in the school that saved their life. In fact, we just hired our eighth person, an African American young woman who came to my office the other day. Thank you, Mr. Kirkland. I said, thanks. What do you do? What program are you in? She said, no, I want to be graduates. I went through the program, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology, got my degree on back, <laughs> which is really fabulous. Uh, we do clay. This is called kids' work. Now, artistic aptitude, whatever that is, is not a requirement to get into the program. I don't care about that. What I care about is that the kids are going to get on the school bus to come to the center. But we can get them that far, that's about half of The other half is actually teaching them something. Now, most of the kids do not become artists, by the way, when they go to college, I don't care. The arts is a bridge to walk across to a new life. The problem is the kid can't imagine himself in circumstances different than the ones that they were born into. The arts provides them with an environment that says there are different images in the world that you can acquire. They look like this, and, and that's the answer to this thing. Now, before Gordon Parks died, he came. Chester Higgins, Eli Reed, Al Gore, and Carl Fisher. His wife had a very different time when I brought her to the kid. So I bring the greatest clay artists, photography artists, visual artists in the world to mentor these kids once a month at my center. The theory being, that's the way they'll figure out how to be like them when they grow up. This is called kids work. That's a piece of kids did for the school. We have photography. That kid's not working for Disney. We got a scholarship in this trip that program. This is the gallery. This is the kid show. Eighth graders. Now, this is my concept of what a gallery is supposed to look like. And these are the kids' show. These are black inner city and poor white inner city kids. By the way, there's absolutely no difference between black kids and white kids. They learn about the same. They behave about the same. I want you to come work for me. You've got to tone down the Jesus stuff a little bit. Be the enthusiasm. I can't get the parents to come. Stop so them to come. They took the keys to the van and went to these parents' homes. We've got 10 parents, 20 parents. The last show was 20 parents. But we didn't pick up one parent. Because now it's socially not cool not to show up to make sure the parents can be able to support the kids. Because people think you're a bad parent. And there's no statistical difference between white mothers and black mothers and Asian mothers and families. Mothers will go with the kids get nurtured every day. So we got that figured out. This is an old slide. This is our old digital imaging center. But I, it's a longer story, but we have a new imaging center based on that slide because I did this presentation for the pack. They got so excited about the engagement of Lady Bob and the systems they did to go with it. But I'm putting kids in the road out of school inside right now of that digital imaging forward that transfer technology. We invented a process in our center to take a computer image, we can make a decal out of it, put on a piece of clay and make it permanent by firing it with a kiln. 
So any computer energy in general is going to be small. Uh, we just made an app of the process. And this is all going on a black school with no inner city. So suppose they're going to have about science and the art. This is our music hall. This is what Will was talking about. Um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie showed up in 1986 in the Earth Rock and Center. We had never performed a concert. He was the first concert. And he said, you ought to go one of these in every city in America. I'm going to do it. And I said, we've done more than enough, man. He came. He said, now nah, I'm going to allow you to record a concert. I'm going to give you the rights to the Which he did. And then he told uh, Nancy Wilson, one of the drums, and Nancy showed up, and Herbie Hancock, and the Cody Tyner, and the Count Basie Orchestra, and Pat Metheny, and Bill Jackson, Dave Rivera and Wink Marcellus and Elvis Marcellus, and it's been quite a ride. <laughs> and, uh, we now have 600 recordings. We won three Grammys. I think we were, we had won a Grammy in the UK. We now have three. Nancy Wilson won our first Grammy recorded with us. She recorded with RCA for 20 years and won a Grammy. Her Christmas album from 2000. Should have won. Yeah, it did. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Well, that interesting, I'm going to talk about that in one second. This, anyway, this is the music. You um, like that? That's all in night. Bill Dizzy, Billy Taylor, Pat Matheny. This room was designed by the engineers for Paul Simon. We have one of the best digital image, digital recording studios in America. And this is what Will was talking about. Uh, that was her first album. They all ended up on Oprah three days before Christmas doing excerpts from this album. I saw it, man. And Oprah said, what is the Manchester Craft doing? And why are you giving the rights to this music to something called the Manchester Craft Field? And Nancy said, it's my equity. It's the way I can help this guy start doing something. So we have become very close friends. Her next album won her Grammy, and we're releasing a third one for this Christmas. We do the poems of Maya Angelou and Jeff. They this was burned out during the riots. Was the office building built for you there? Uh, there was, yeah, I think so. Okay. There, this is the model I built. There's the office building. Right. Uh, it's 60,000 square foot, it's a medical tech building. The point of the story is, we're now starting to build centers around the center. Because I, I like building buildings, it's not boards, so I don't build those buildings. <laughs> so this one worked out pretty good. We filled it up with tenants, there's the fountain. The University of Pittsburgh Medical Center took half the building for the building operation. On the stretch of down, Lisa Lyon, born eight million bucks to the building. Fil got it filled up with downtown tenants. And Melanie, of which I am now a director. Is, is Melanie here? Really. No, I think we're in Boston. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm on the board of the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they're, they're good guys. This is the entrance to the building. This is the kind of facilities that people want to go to work in. In mind. When we started this, the employees from the medical center refused to come to work because they thought they were going into this black neighborhood and they were going to get killed. Well, now it's become the destination of choice for the whole medical center. They've never had a bad experience with food grade, they love the environment. And those flowers that you see sitting around, those aren't plastic, those are real, those are called workers. They're <laughs> growing that green. Yeah, we built a 40,000 square foot greenhouse next to the training center in the north side. And uh, so we're now growing orchids. And we now, we're selling them a giant eagle with some grocery store chain. And we just signed up Whole Foods. So they're now selling our stuff. And so they have welfare mothers growing orchids in the middle of the black neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Now we ain't doing this to get rich selling orchids. The idea is to have a diversified revenue stream, to train people for the horticultural industry, the real reason. And we're doing that big time. All the landscapers are our guys. And we have welfare moms and members of the Orchid Society talking about orchids, which is the answer. We've got to get this thing off of poverty. We've got to start talking about life. And that's worked out fine. There's a tissue lab. These are the orchids we're growing. We're also winning first and second place in the Orchid Society. Showers. We're also growing tomatoes. These are kind of dope dirt. And I got into this because I got interested in them. So we're now growing them as a demonstration crop. And uh, you'll see the main plants 14 feet in the air if you come to my school. Or the all the trees. And uh, those are the tomatoes. 
And we're also starting to get issues. Homework assignment is check out the price of these things at the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see exactly what I'm broke. Uh, $3.99 a pound market rate for that. And this is a new slide. We'll have to see this one. Uh, I met a guy at Silicon Valley. I was out there doing a little slideshow. This kid came out of the audience and said, Man, that's a show. It's back. We do for a little bit. So I built a company called eBay. I said, oh, that's cool. You got a card? I didn't know anybody from a glass of water. <laughs> but I went back and I asked one of the little techie kids at the school said, what is eBay? He said, oh, Mr. Strickland, that's an electronic card. I said, oh, this folks I've got a guy who opened up. So I called him back up and I said, Mr. Scott, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation of the I thought you figured out something else. Here's $500,000 to get you going. I said, do it well. I said, go to your first reputation. And so Jeff and I, against all probability, would become good friends. This kid's got five million bucks. He's 40 years old. I think I'm going to have never heard of two years in LA. And he gave me a pile of money and we created the division of our center called the National Center for Arts and Technology. And this is new. This is the division that's going to start building these schools all over this country and eventually all over the world. And so we've got three open. This is the one that's now open in San Francisco. There's the space. That's Jeff on the right. You have the one in the middle with the kids. That's what it will look like someday. Uh, Cincinnati is now open. They're in an old industrial building. Here's the gallery. There's the uh, imaging center. We doubled the graduation rate, by the way, for these kids in the first year of operation. Uh, the Tech and Toyota. This is the newest one. This one's open in Grand Rapids, called the Western Michigan Center for Arts and Technology. They bought that building downtown, started renovating it. And that's what it looks like. It looks actually much better. This will be artist record. I haven't had a chance to upgrade the flagship. But it looks like the Starship Enterprise. It, how, how big the building is it? The whole building is about 35 to 40,000 square feet. And that's your reputation? 15,000 for now. But they started to expand. They bought the whole building because they knew they were going to grow. So they didn't want to be competing against themselves in the future. So they just bought the whole building. The chairman of Steelcase came to Pittsburgh and saw my center and said, we'll go for these in Grand Rapids. So he had a guy named Doug DeVos, who built Amway. Those two guys hooked up. They raised $6 million in 60 days, bought the building, set up the program, and went out training people for the DeVos medical system. Wow. And uh, digital imaging program for the Grand Rapids Public School. I was up there the other day, man, it's off the charts. It is absolutely stunning. And uh, they're doing a lot of good things. These are kids doing photography. And we're now in New Orleans. Uh, we're we're going to build a food training program here for the victims of the hurricane. We're going to Philadelphia because Edgar Dell, good old Democrat, showed up at my place three weeks ago. Six, no, I'm sorry, three months ago. Loved it and said we're going to Philadelphia. So we've got the Secretary of Education to commit planning on one of the ones we put out. So we've got Philly in planning, New Orleans is in planning. We're talking a few of those cities, and we're talking to four countries, and I predict that Belfast is going to be our first and next while next year. She's the first bank of Ireland. And the goal is that what's the cost of one of these facilities? Okay. Um, let me yeah. stop. Um, two things. One, uh, I want to build 100 cities in the United States. I want to go to 100 pounds of work. So the goal is to go to 200 cents. Yes. 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 <laughs>